Good afternoon. We're um, live from uh, San Diego, and we're talking today with Dr. Cassano. And Dr. Cassano has an expertise in environmental science, um, really dealing with toxic exposures. So I'd like you to start off by telling me about your sort of your educational history. If we could start with that. Um, well, um, I, I went to college up in Westchester and then um, did graduate work in human genetics at Columbia uh, and then decided that, uh, at that point um, I had a choice of where to go to medical school and I decided to do the um, Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences, which is a medical school for all of the, not only the armed forces, but also the Coast Guard um, and the Public Health Service. Uh, and so after you completed all your medical training, were you in the service for a period of time I was well? in the service for 24 years. Okay. Um, I first trained as an undersea uh, medical officer, which included diving and submarine medicine, and then um, did my residency at the University of Michigan in occupational and environmental medicine. Okay. So I'd like to sort of focus on the, obviously, the occupational environmental medicine, because a lot of our service men and women have been exposed to things in, depending on which period of war we're talking about, correct? Mm -hmm. And so, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is there's this list of presumptive conditions that, after a really a long drawn out sort of legal battle and political battle, that VA now recognizes as if someone had boots on the ground in Vietnam that, and they later develop something, for example, like lung cancer, it's automatically presumed. But there are other cancers that are not presumptive. Mm -hmm. um, and those veterans um, would have to use what we call a medical nexus opinion to show that their exposure led to this Asian orange exposure or whatever chemical or herbicide it was led to the particular disease. Could you talk a little bit about those kinds of medical exposures and disabilities? Well, as I alluded to earlier, um, Agent Orange is sort of a scapegoat for everything bad that happened in Vietnam. And so when you look at the exposures and you look at the medical conditions that, that people have developed, the first thing you have to do is look at the medical literature, because that is constantly evolving, in order to determine um, whether there is scientific grounds for saying a person who was exposed to Agent Orange or the arsenicals that were in some of the other um, herbicides um, could possibly have it related to um, this medical condition. So um, that's the first step, at which point you then have to interweave what that individual's um, medical history was, what that individual's exposure history was, and what his other risk factors were uh, to develop this particular disease. And you've got to weave all of this into a, um, a cogent argument for the nexus. And so in these kinds of situations, it's going to be really important, obviously, to take a detailed medical history or to have it in the records already. Mm -hmm. If it's just a records review, so that you can do the analysis, and it's not something you can say, well, everyone who's exposed to Agent Orange has this, you have to really dig in and do it on a case by case basis. So, you also mentioned that it's just Agent Orange, these, I'm going to try and say the word correctly, arsenicals um, and chemical exposures didn't just happen in Vietnam, obviously. We know, for example, that there were other occurrences in Thailand. And so, for those veterans, there's a it's a working rule, but it's not a presumption, in essence. Exactly. And so those individuals need a specific medical opinion mm -hmm. as well. And so, and I, I don't mean to be flipped with this question, but why are you the one that's qualified to do these kinds of opinions? What, um, well, what is I, it about your history and training that... I'm probably that's not the only person that's, <laughs> that's qualified to do this, but I think I need criteria that a lot of people don't. Number one, I was in the military for 24 years. I was a physician in the military. I was an occupational physician in the military. So I took care of people that had all sorts of exposures. Now, um, I was a little, I'm a little young still to have been a doctor in Vietnam, but, um, but if you understand the military, you understand how people are exposed. You understand the fact that precautions aren't taken that might normally be taken. When you're trying to um, dodge bullets and grenades and IEDs, 
you're not particularly concerned about how much of that diesel exhaust you're breathing. Right. Um, and that becomes a problem when veterans try to reconstruct their history and say, well, you didn't complain about this when you came back from overseas. No, I had a few other things on my mind. Um, so I understand that and I understand where to go in order to find out what somebody actually did. I'll look at what's called a military occupational specialty. I'll look at a Navy enlisted classification. And then when I go through a record, I just don't look at the DD-214. I look at every single solitary um, organization that they were assigned to and pretty much read through what are called fit reps or enlisted evals um, in order to see what this guy actually did. Because most of the time, especially in the Navy, mm -hmm. you're working outside of your MLS for a lot of what you do. Okay. Um, the second thing is, I know the rules. Mm -hmm. I know the regs. Um, and when you've got that kind of expertise, I can write that into a medical opinion in, in some way. Not, not to take your job away from you. I nope. never want to do that. Nope. But it really helps uh, when you're talking about something like, say, chloracne. And they say, well, you don't have a diagnosis of chloracne. And I'll say, well, because nobody understood that there was a relationship back then. However, that's why the rule says any acne form right. disorder yep. that could be construed as chloracne. Um, and so when you feed that back to the RO in a medical opinion, um, they have to pay attention to it. It's not that I think they were trying to, I think they're good people working at VA, I really do. Um, and they try very and hard. And I, I agree with that. It's um, a very difficult task, and in, 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 in these and, kinds of cases, in particular, they, don't, they might not have the expertise they need. And they, they rely on and you're probably going to get into this next week, <laughs> but they rely on people in the, on the medical side that don't have the expertise to sort it out for them. And so that was exactly where I wanted to go next. Sometimes the VA will do a compensation and pension examination. Um, sometimes that could be done by a nurse practitioner, a physician's assistant, and they're giving opinions on exposure and disabilities related to those exposures. And so what is your sort of general impression of when, when you're reviewing a record and you see one of those opinions? What, what is your role? Well, it depends on, and again, the rules say that it, it doesn't matter who does the opinion, it's how they rationalize the, the, the result. And so I sometimes sound like I'm hard on mid-level providers. Um, but the fact of the matter is, if individuals do not have at least basic expertise in occupational medicine and toxicology, they can't possibly sort this out properly unless they're going to spend an inordinate amount of time reviewing the peer-reviewed literature that they may not actually have access to where they're, where they're at. Um, General references such as, you know, up to date or the Mayo Clinic website or Cleveland Clinic website are talking, when they talk about risk factors and they talk about etiology of a disease, they're looking at it from the general public perspective. They're not looking at it from specific, for specific cohorts. So if you don't see Agent Orange in, uh, in up to date or on the Mayo Clinic website, um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Right, so you may have to have access to different things. And so that brings up an, another important question. It isn't, it, it isn't just reviewing the records, you're also doing research, medical research, into the most current articles and thoughts going, and processes going into this sort of analysis, or what kind of disabilities mm -hmm. are related to what kind of Exposure. Yeah, exactly. You have to be doing that. I mean, the, the IOM reports, which we count on a lot, but which are, were primarily used to determine presumptions for the VA, um, remember those are consensus documents. And they may place more weight on a certain set of studies than they do on another. And it, there's a lot of discussion and compromise and um, 
and back and forth and uh, to, to get to a consensus opinion as what they're going to say as far as limited or suggestive evidence or you know de definitive evidence or you know no evidence right. um, and so you always have to go beyond that you actually have to look at some of the papers that they've reviewed and I've done that on a couple of times and I've taken exception in some instances to some of their interpretations um, and then you have to look at the literature that's been published since they started their studies because if the if the report comes out in 2014, they haven't looked at literature since 2013. Okay. So there's more up to date. There's more up to date stuff. So let's suppose a veteran uh, has a type of cancer that isn't recognized as presumptive either due to clean uh, camp lejeune or due to Agent Orange. Or what is it you would want to see from them? To just sort of. Um, what I need to see is number one, what they did. Let's say, you know, if they were in Vietnam, it usually helps to see what they were doing in Vietnam when you don't, when, when you're not covered by the presumption, where they were, how long they were there, what else were they exposed to? I see so many times, you know, these guys were construction battalion guys. And you know, so they're kicking up dust and dirt all over the place. Right. Um, they're digging in it. Uh, they're also exposed to diesel exhaust, which is uh, which is you know, 1.5 percent by weight benzene, right. uh, which is another exposure. They're not protected. They're not um, taking any precautions at all. Mm -hmm. So I need all of that. Um, I need what helps greatly. Um, in cancer cases is the type of cancer the person has. Uh, when you look at esophageal cancer, now esophageal cancer is not one that is right. presumptive. There is some literature on especially gastroesophageal junction cancers that are associated with um, exposure to dioxins. And so I need to know where where the cancer was, if, it, if the guy, especially if somebody smoked, if somebody smoked mm -hmm. and they've got a, a, an upper esophageal squamous cell carcinoma, yep. it's going to be really hard for me uh, to, to say that this was due to Agent Orange. But if it's, a, if it's lower down the tract and it's an adenocarcinoma, whether or not the person had Barrett's esophagus, which right. some people bring into play, I can usually make a case for that. So, what their job was, what they're exposed to, what the cancer is, location of cancer, coach. and other risk factors. And the other risk factors. We really appreciate your time. So, thank you. It's been fun. Thank you. <laughs> appreciate it.